and don't let everybody else shout you down when you're on your own journey. You're looking into this to find out what, you know, you're going to form your own opinion. It's something people are really scared to do, but think about it. You know, if we're going to go out there and have conversations, I mean, it doesn't mean we always know exactly, you know, there's so much mystery when you look into the ancient history, but, um, you know, you're on the path of being open-minded enough to receive new information that might change your opinion. Whereas other people, they've kind of made their opinion up 20 years ago. That all calcifies in the brain, shuts down the whole open mind concept, puts them in a tunnel vision. And then you just try to go, hey, you know what? Uh, yeah, it looks like the pyramids were built a lot sooner than the Egyptian empire. So what's up with that? Or it looks like uh, half the Bible was mistranslated and thrown out in the garbage and nobody knows about that. What does that do? And you just go and, and they're just like, no, no, no. You know, you just get to a point where you say, well, fine, then everybody's on their own journey. And but don't let that deter you from staying on your own journey. You know, that's all I did for myself. I'm fascinated by this. And I'm always wondering, why am I fascinated by it? Why am I even with this whole pandemic thing? Why am I naturally curious to find out if there might be other doctors, scientists and experts that have a different opinion than the World Health Organization or Bill Gates? Why? Why am I? Cu I'm curious. It's a curiosity that wasn't destroyed in me by the academia because I didn't get schooled like that. So, but other people aren't even curious. They're just like, as soon as you start talking, hey, it's kind of interesting. You know, there's 2,600 doctors that disagree with the thing. Or the guy that invented the test that everybody was relying on all these numbers, he, he came out and said that this test isn't used for these influenza viruses. Isn't that interesting? They're like, they're, no, it can't be. And why would that be, Michael? With this subject, with any subject, you're the one that opened up the book on it. It has to do with psychology. Psychology is rooted in trauma and repression. So is trauma and angst and all that kind of stuff just a product of our lives today? Or maybe you could give a little bit of a summary of the idea of a catastrophe of this, even this, if there was some visitation, what that might have done to stunt or change or alter the growth of the psyche of human beings, right? Because that, that's a factor. And then these elite priestarchies who work on behalf of who knows what, they know how to manipulate and push all those buttons like a switchboard. Well, we're run by institutionalization. You know, it, it has a lot. You can come at it from different angles, from a philosophical angle or from these alt alternative angles. Uh, you can come at it, just my latest article to called uh, In God and Ruins about devolution. It's not that I believe it, but, you know, I've read Michael Cremo. I'm fascinated. Like you're saying, I'm open-minded. Right? Most of my looking at it doesn't quite buy into their theory, but there's a thread of truth there because there are elements. Like, for instance, even talking about disease, I didn't put this into the article, but there's a concept that because the human body can in fact, you know, because of its organs and its constitution, come down with literally so many diseases, right? That that alone is a proof of devolution. Because once when we were different kinds of being, we had an immune system that, you know, that just wasn't the reality. I know I'm talking a little theosophical here, but again, I can pick up things because, you know, I'm not urinating on it. I'm not saying this is, you know, off limits. And in the theory of devolution, the very fact that man is plagued with cancers, plagued with, shows an infirmity, right? You see? Uh, and that infirmity would tell another person, yeah, well, that's the proof we're talking about. The man is a fallen, is a god in ruins. Just his physicality, right? Or you can come at it from the Reikian way, you know, and there's other ways to come at these things. But that's what I want. I want to have an omnidirectional understanding of things with the hope that I'm getting to the understanding of it. But that's not a simple journey. That's not straight down in any kind of way. It's a very spiralic idea where you have to keep walking around a thing, keep posing the question. And then even more where the philosophy comes in, you must love the questioning. Because there's certain answers that won't come unless you do. And you can beat it over the head and you can keep at it. But until you fall in love with the act of questioning, the answer will always remain remote. That's a law, a philosophical law, by the way. It's why most of the questions that somebody like Plato and Aristotle answered, you know, asked back then, uh, 3, 000, 300 years BC still haven't been answered. Okay. Hundreds and hundreds of points. We've made almost no progress in all of the years on, on certain, on, in certain areas, right? But <clears throat> the institutionalization, say, take the medical, which again, what, what are we learning from 2020? Well, everyone should learn right now that the people who call themselves medics and physicians know fucking nothing about immunity or real health. They are good at prevention of disease. And even then, they want to sell you a product and dispense some poison that has more side effects than the original disease. You have to know about that. And you've also got to decide for yourself whether you're going to confront these men in the white coats should you ever come in front of them and then set the ball rolling where they now know you're a fucking, you know, 
renegade into the center, or you have to sort of meet them halfway and act like a dumbass, you know, and play play your own game. You know, these are all questions people have to ask because there's actual danger in getting into the machine by confronting them and going, "You're a bunch of fucking fakes." These are very, these are Knights Templars that you know when you dig down deep in. These are very powerful cult. These men in the white coats. So you have you have to pick you know what you want to do with that. But you know, before you walk in, that these are institutionalized brains, right? They don't know anything about health. They only know about disease and its treatment, right? And then you go over here and you go over there and you go over here and, and you start to deconstruct it, right? That's a lot of work. That's a lot of work for people to look into. Why is capitalism really, you know, corporate socialism? Why, is, why, did, the, why did any of these liberalistic movements become so radically leftist? How did that actually happen? Who are its advocates? Are we really talking Marxism or are we talking about the hybrid of Marcuse? And what's the difference? You see, this all takes time. Sure, I can't have no fun. I can't be dancing and clicking my heels if I, if I have to go into all of that. But the good news is that a lot of people are discovering this now. And a lot of people are saying, you know, I've got the time. This lockdown is providing everybody with time. Yeah. Time to do the right thing. And, and believe me, there's opportunities come about. It's whether you seize it or not. When the, when the ship is, you know, not even able to move a couple of inches because there's no wind for the sails and you find yourself, what are you going to do? You just have to kick back. There's nothing you can do. You can't even get out and push. So you have to just, uh, it's called the doldrums. Yeah. Are you going to be the man who knows, oh, what rewards I have with the doldrums, how I can turn that into priceless gold? Because I'm going to pick up that book. I'm going to scan that website. I'm going to really, you know, set along a research that I had to set aside earlier, you know, and I'm going to, I'm going to, get back on track with that or i'm going to deconstruct right i'm going to take something up and i'm going to take it apart i don't believe it yeah we'll start with physics start with uh, medical health <laughs> you know start with um uh, start with uh, the secret societies of the world and their connection to satanic pedophilia you know <clears throat> how many Irish people know that jerry rice was a, a jerry uh uh I'm thinking of the football player. Uh, how many people know that Jerry Adams and his coterie were pedophiles? The leaders of the IRA and Sinn Féin were pedophiles. How many know that they were Islamo-communists? What, 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 what connection could the IRA possibly have with the Palestinians or the Islam? Oh, yeah, well, why don't you try, try and find out? Right. So when I read these books by these great men, and, and you just showed Phil Snyder and his work there, you see, that is what I love. When I use the word love, I use it in that context. Those are precious books to me, right? Edda Dorfa, you know, Hatcher Childress, Ralph Ellis. You know, my hands shake when I used to pick those books up. They were precious to me. I, I went hungry and poor, you know, to, to, to make sure that these books, some of them were hundreds of dollars, you know, would be bought and, re and not only bought, but read. You know, because and, and I never look back on that. Never, even, no matter how much, agony and you know all the rest of it was you know uh befell me on that path i have still stood strong and said the hell with it you know it was worth it because the the real knowledge is like going through a labyrinth in the dark you know but uh yeah you have to you have to value it and when you value it you know a different sort of action happens and then you're not really concerned about all the detractors and the scoffers and all of that you see or other resistances that, that come up, you know, with people pirating your work or <clears throat> literally magpieing your work or whatever. You see, you can withstand all of that stuff because what you're doing is so vital and it's a continual process of, of further revelation. Now, to back it up, like I said, I'll, I'll say it again. I then take, I look into the science world and find out its latest discoveries and they often corroborate, not just my work, but say a Beaumont or whatever, and I make sure those are available for people. So when you come to my work, be prepared to dislike it because it is so well proven. You know, have a have a bad day. These especially these intellectual types who want to come and you know refute you and just scoff at you. But they find eminent people ten times smarter than them reference all the time. And I do that because this knowledge is sacrosanct. And when we present it to the world, we have a duty to make sure that it is in a nice setting, and so that these lunatic low level people so many of them with degrees but that see just because your stuff is like take it <clears throat> take a peer reviewing of a book or a article it means nothing you can be peer reviewed from every single collegiate in the world 
from Leningrad, from Moscow University to Tel Aviv, right, to Paris, to the Sorbonne, whatever, it doesn't mean anything. It still doesn't mean that you're not right. It still doesn't mean that your work is full of holes, right? You could be peer reviewed by everybody in the book and some little Walter Russell who's never even seen the light of day is right and you're wrong. It means nothing. It's just more institutionalization. Your work could still be full of contradictions, full of holes, peer review my ass, right? Especially today. And, you know, wasn't every geological paper, you know, I don't know about Geike, uh, Agizes, and Lyle, and all, weren't they all peer reviewed? Yeah, well, they're all fucking wrong. It took Emmanuel Velikovsky or a Beaumont to come and tell you, you know, here's how it really happened, right? Everybody that refuted uh, Thomas L. Thompson, I bet you they were all peer reviewed, all these biblicists and archaeologists. What did it mean? They're all wrong. They still don't know how the pyramid was built. They still don't know what you know dynasties existed before Egypt. They're still telling you blatant lies about the Egyptians and their customs and habits. The lies that are told with Ireland, oh my God, you'd need another millennia to uh, you know scrape that off. The lies about the papacy, the lies about the Jesuits, right? The lies about masonry, the lies you know against uh, other forms of conspiracy. There's so many layers of lies. So this is excavation, you know. And and there, and believe me, not everybody is, you know, going to be honed into it or you know be. But they don't need to be because we've got people like myself who do it, and then you know we hand you the results. But see, when I hand the results to the world, it is not of any concern to me what they think about it. My work is done vocationally, right? And then that's it. At that point but but who in, the, in this world has ever realized that these ley lines were there partly for good right so that the earth could be healed from ancient cataclysm like you just spoke of but then was co-opted by later races who wanted to bury not just you know beings but other caches of other things at certain vertices where they'd use the earth's protection how many people have wondered about the ritual of burial right they do it every, you know, it happens all the time Whoever thought about where the custom came from? And so on and so on and so on. So, yeah, it's about an open mind. But unfortunately, we have the we have these institutions of complete and utter, right? Uh, So-called civilization, right? But they're not. They're cancerous groups that are actually uh, bringing the death of civilization. You know, and, and of course, one of the pillars of that is Western civilization. Well, that's being chewed at and gnawed. So if that pillar falls, don't you see the whole temple of civilization anywhere could be, could be, uh, you know, could fall. And fall on what? The rats of this idiotic extreme leftist whose own paradigms are so contradictory? Right? They're inherently contradictory. Relativism. Right? None of you can be right. There's no objective truth. You mean accept yours? Well, yeah, that's right. Everything I believe uh, is right, and I also want to have that institutionalized. The shit I believe must be believed by you and everybody else. Yeah, but that just contradicts your first statement, that there's no objective truth. Crickets. <laughs> yeah, but we're the exception. We're the exception. So shut up. We're going to defund you. We're going to silence you. We're going we're gonna to squash your free speech. Don't point out contradictions of myself to myself. I'll, I'll explode. Uh, right? You'll just be... My head will just, you know, melt. You have no rights to tell me that I'm living a lie and that I'm spreading it like an infection throughout the whole planet. Well, okay. And everybody just sits back and is accepting that. Right? We have to look at it. It's just running the streets in madness. Yeah. And then you, you, you tell me I don't want to look at the psychology of why people let this happen. Sure, you can shout these guys down and the monkeys and an idiot. An idiot. They're idiots. You could, you could shout them down. In seconds, why haven't people done it? Where are all the eminent people? Where are all the psychologists who say, well, it's just a bunch of constitutional moral and fears and neurotic, sorry, here's, you know, here's a few points of how to deal with them. Right? Why has the Western mind not learning from all of these other groups to say they're sacrosanct, they matter, right? Not one of these people from any of the universities who preach multiculturalism, have ever studied anything about the history of the cultures that they champion, you know, in Africa or India. They don't know anything about their religions. They don't know anything about their structures. They talk, they, for years and years, the original feminists talk about matriarchy, which, which fell into the hole. It's a complete lie. There never were any matriarchal societies, all right? 
the presence of women and their influence was was there in tribes but it was never a matriarchy it was a different format they've had to accept that now but book after book after book after book and lecture after lecture from all the prestigious colleges of the world it took this Maria Gimbetus nonsense and these Margaret Meads and all the other slosh that they had you know could concoct and taught this out from the academics from the academic platforms of the world not one bit of it is true and we, I could go on out and find out with other you know acts of disinformation who stood up and refuted it? So we have to, we have uh, need no faith in any of this institutionalized stuff. But the one thing you have is that we will build new colleges, new schools, more conservative, more rational, and we'll do it. We'll build it from scratch if need be. That's the solution oriented. So again, the message is never negative. If those ones didn't work and they failed the crud, right? And th those were poisoning the mind with a socialistic, communistic nonsense, is Marcuse nonsense. Guess what? We'll just build new ones that don't allow that kind of scum. You see, you put the teachers on probation and you make sure that only healthy things are taught. Things that are rational, honed by time. Relativism. Deconstruction, you know, post-humanism, post-modernism. Post Determinism. They, yeah, they contradict themselves. How can you speak against objective truth and then say that only your truth is then the one to be that's non-subjective, that's, you know, that is truly objective. That's tyranny, that's fascism when one group says, I want my, see it's not relativism, it is the uh, cover, relativism is just a cover for saying, I want our paradigm to be the dominant one throughout the whole world. It's fascism pure and some, it's probably the essence of fascism. It's like, if you imagine it was in a household, where any one tyrannical, brutal, cruel, sadistic, illogical, irrational, schizophrenic person, suddenly did in fact have a whip big enough to say everything i'm about right if i say the moon is made of cheese right it is if i say black is white it is and that's the kind of world we're going into and we're letting it happen right so there's you know i'm not fatalistic i think that a great thing is going to come out of this but the thing is that uh, we should never forget you know this year and the contradictions mark those down and don't let them fade away with time because these are vital things to remember about the kind of mentality that's running the streets right now and is in government right now. And it's important to see total institution, governmentality, adultism, things I've been talking for years and people just you know glaze over. Now is your chance to actually take a reading of these things and discover their anatomy. Yeah, it's it's amazing what you've you've threaded into it because it all it didn't just rise up this this uh hysterical way of looking at things and the the lies and all that and the loons running around the political strife the social strife that didn't just suddenly happen because it's the 21st century it's it's something that goes back and it's something that's rooted in trauma and it's something that's rooted in a lot of things and a lot of lies and deception people have been uh as as schneider was saying and many others and we're saying people have been misled propagandized lied to outright manipulated um, you know, their consciousness has been tortured. They've been shut off from the great minds of people that were just looking, as you said, in a vocational way, that were genius minds that brought different ways of looking at things together. They were edited out and censored out of our reality. The children are not taught this, right? And you get to this point where here we are with this global situation and the push for this new world order that people like me have been talking about forever. The, these elites, they want to centralize power even more. They want to change it up, you know, 2.0, upgrade, whatever. Um, and now it's right in front of everybody's face. So that's why I know instinctively, and I know from the comments I'm getting and the emails I'm getting and the conversations I'm having, that people are now starting to realize, yeah, there's something else going on. And all I can say is, pull up a seat, man. Pull up a seat and I'll tell you how long things have been going wrong, how deep it goes, literally and figuratively, how far off the map we are on so many different things, including the very origins of where we come from. Look, at we're walking around saying, oh, we need peer reviews, we need all this stuff official, whatever, before it's truth. We're all traumatized and we've, we don't even know where we came from. We can't even settle that debate. The Darwinists and the creationists have been battling it out for ever. This was one of the points uh, Lloyd Pye, God rest his soul, brought up in one of his fantastic books, Everything You Know Is Wrong, which is an, a brilliant statement because it's important to approach subjects like that. And he's like, what about a different way of looking at what if you're going to have two forces battling it out forever and ever and ever, isn't there another place? Isn't there something else missing? That's why they're able to battle it out.
and and one day the determ one day the Darwinists get the edge, one day the creationists gets the edge, and you go, well, but something's missing. Let's look in the middle. And then nobody even knows who Lloyd Pye is. The guy had to die without even be able to finish mm -hmm. his experiments, you know, sadly. But good thing he wrote these and books. Good thing we collected them and we can keep him alive and ideas like that alive by doing this work and doing this from a place of sincerity and integrity. Yeah. Uh, we had, uh, who, who's ever heard of Augustus Le Plongeon? They not only talked about the Maya culture, mm -hmm. he categorically linked it to the, you know, the Egyptian culture. <clears throat> The, the establishment came down on him. You know, this is in the 1800s, right? Barry fell in the 20th century. The establishment came down on him. We had a guest several times on the Richard Cassaro, remember? He was yep, talking about the dispersion of all <clears throat> incredible work on uh, how the triad, you were talking earlier about the Phrygians and the, uh, the Etruscans. One trait that a lot of these, all of these different nations had in common was the triad. Whether it was in a pantheon, whether it was with the divinities, whether it was in architecture, you see, <coughs> it wasn't just the Pythagoreans. That's a hallmark. So is it goddess related? Is it some other sort of geometry? Is it some worship of Orion or whatever, you know? And so you lo start looking, you develop pattern recognition that even though the gods of the earth or the gods of the storm, you know, are different names and different cultures, you know, Dionysus, Prometheus, whatever, you start to see that behind the name is, is, is an archetype. So as you develop this knowledge, you start getting into your Youngs and your, your Joseph Campbells, you know, but you find out, see, as I said before, when I would discover, you know, another great maverick, like an Alvin Boyd Kuhn or Albert Churchward or Mercia Eliade or Augustus Le Plongeon, that's what I lived for, right? That, that was the beads on my necklace. That was like, oh, that's another notch in the gun. That is what I live for, not sitting down and talking to a bunch of fucking arseholes Right, who, who who believe in some Marxist nonsense or any of the above, right? Learning about sacred geometry, learning about gematria, right? Learning about different. I, know, I believe in magic, right? I'm an, uh, uh, I wouldn't call myself an occultist, but I'm I'm a esotericist. My work is cut out for me. That's a tradition. But I don't set these narrow things. Well, that's Kabbalah. I can't go over. I'm not going to study that or goddess traditions, right? Or this or that and the other. It's all open because we've left the realm of the piss artists, right? Who want to urinate. You know, once you've gone into the temple of the holy place, it's not the marketplace. That's back there. You're now in the sanctum, right? And it's only your own sensitivity and your own uh, love of truth, right? That matters. The world no longer matters. You know, so that's what that, that's the. Uh, I'm not preaching that to anybody else. It's just the, the way I have approached this work, right? Because when you when I found out the work of these people these great scholars, to me, that was the treasure, right? And, and it really is the treasure. It's what's, it's what's going to make you sane because you can't go against this beast out there in any shape or form, not even these loonies who are running around now who are very low level. But that, that great oppressive force, right, which has conditioned the minds of all of these people is very, very powerful. You know, it's like a big dragon or whatever. But I call it the predator in the long grass. You cannot go after it unless you're totally suited up and you've got the silver bullets, you know, and you've got the skill to use it. So all of these things that we're saying, that is going to discount a lot of people who will never, no matter what you do, come around this information, you know? And also we're not dogmatic, so we're not, we're not begging them to do it. You've got to fall in love with the process. See, if you didn't, then how could, you know, the suicide rate right now, people just checking out because if you didn't do it from love, you couldn't get through a particular time like this that to a lot of people seems very, very frightening, very, very dark and oppressive. I've never thought about that one time in all of this mess. Because when you're intelligent, you're on very strong ground, right? It's like I'm using. It's like Aikido. I use the force of the other person against him. His head is going to crack of his own charging at me. Just step aside, and they're done, right? Because the man has gotten fucking intelligence, and I've backed it up with L.A. Waddell and Commons Beaumont and Augustus Laplongeon and Barry Fell and Kersey Graves and fucking Gerald Massey, right? We're mighty. You are a fucking weak loser. You're jelly. And you can bring all the degrees and the peer reviews, right? I got my Lloyd Pies, man. I've got, you know, the greats. I've got my Ralph Ellis's. Go figure, right? They'll never take these people on. They'll never, and if they do it, they'll just do it from afar, you know, throwing stones or, you know, throwing muck. Or more important, censoring. Shut up. Don't yeah. remind me of my lunacy. 
Don't hold up a mirror to my lunacy. I'm going to rule the world. Well, they're giving it their best shot, and actually it's failing. Anyone who really looks beneath the headlines now, George Soros and Bill Gates and these people are not happy campers. They are losing because there's yeah. just enough sane, logical, smart people who go, the more you talk, the more I know you're a liar. The more you speak, I know you're a worm tongue. Keep talking. I'm photographing you. I'm recording. And everything you say is contradictory, right? including the core philosophies that have animated you, you know, the feminism and all the rest. All of it is so bankrupt. And now, why I'm not pessimistic about the, these in 2020 is because this is the best time for even a layman now to see that, which we would have to really, you know, pull teeth for them to realize a few things about the left uh, and who's been ruling the world under the name of communism and Islamo communism, all the things we look at. It's actually a little bit more palatable now. I put this little slide up and I said, 75%, this is actual fact, 75% of Americans confess that they're afraid to speak their minds. Thanks very much, because you've just proven every con rational conspiracy theorist 100% correct about their predictions of what's going to come down. So can we move on now? Right, the way is open, unless you're bat fucking crazy. Well, I think that we've won our spots. We've won our stripes. The conspiracy person, the rational one, like the Lloyd Pies and you know uh, the G.A.R. Griffins and all these people who predicted an Orwellian future are 100% correct. It's like Bo Greitz, you know, Lieutenant Colonel said, there's only one truth. And that's the whole truth. Right. Right. And that's what we're looking for. And if, if you fault me for that, just because, oh, there's errors here, or there's a little faux pas there, or there was, you know, a, 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 a cul-de-sac there, you know, dead end over there, well, then I don't want you on the team. Because in the journey I'm going on, I don't look at mistakes. I look at challenges. I'm getting stronger for every mistake I make, for every challenge, for every nitwit that I have to deal with, right? Every knucklehead, every flunky, right? And most of them have degrees. Yeah, but then, you know, so what? You, no matter what degree you have, you're not pissing on knowledge. I will not allow it. Right? You're not going to territorialize gnosis. And that's what they're doing. The ones who run the magazines, the ones who run the newspapers, the ones who run the collegiates of the world are filthy degenerates who have not only killed off mavericks and shut them down, but do it right now in school. And there's many people who confess about this. There's many even degreed people have come out to whistleblow what actually happens, you know, in the whole structure of how you get a degree and what you got to go through. It's all politics. It's nothing to do with the actual love of knowledge uh, and looking at a thing, you know, from a uh, nonpartisan point of view. That's long, long gone. That's why nitwits that you're seeing on TV every day, these talking heads, have PhDs and degrees. They have to lower the goddamn bar so that a fucking imbecile, right? So the cave crawlers could pass. And now you are, they're lecturing you about what they know. Or they're coming at you with vaccines saying, you know, we know all about it. You know nothing about the human immune system. You know nothing about the person who doesn't take your medicine. You have not screened those people. So what do you know? Since everybody in the world takes your medicine, you have no paradigm past the person who won't take it because you've never screened or studied those people. How could you? Because everyone exactly. folds up and takes the medication. Right. So that's the limit of your paradigm. The holistic person is has screened and looked at the people, right, who refuse to take a particular medication for a particular thing and home treat and self treat. But the, every single physician you know has zilch, zero knowledge about that, because by definition everybody takes their cure, right? Well, then what do you know about that disease and how it could, could be cured in other ways if you didn't take the, you know, the medication? Well, you know nothing, right? So your paradigm is more limited than mine. But how many people know how to articulate that? How many people today when they're telling you oh, it's mandatory to take the masks? No, it's not. Go to a civil rights lawyer and ask him if that's the case. Right. There's no laws on the books that can force anybody to do that. But as I've always said, forget politics. Go to legalese. Find out about your actual rights. And you will soon see that when you go to court, the fears of your government don't matter in court. The fears of, your, of the medical profession have no say in court. Because you cannot, let's put it this way, you cannot offend the government. You can only offend your neighbor or, you know, driving in the car or another witness. You know, you can offend a, a, another human being. A human, a human citizen cannot offend an institution. So an institution has no rights over your life at all. You don't even, and, and that's, you're not even being sovereign. You know, one would have hoped that people have gone a little bit further into sovereignty and corporate, soul and, you know, corporate uh, coverage and all of that. But even without that, no institution it's called a corp, which means a dead thing. 
Yeah, it's called corp because that's a legal term that when you when an institution tries to take you to court over something, they're considered dead in the court. You're the living one. And then you say, well, who's, who's, who witnessed me offending? Like, let me give you an example. When the federal government turned up in Waco, now these guys were boogaloo. I might have been going down to take care of them. But in real life, right, when the federal government came to take out David Koresh, all Koresh had to do was get a top lawyer from New York and go, who have I offended? I'm crazy. I keep all these women and children locked up. But how have I offended the federal government? How have I offended Janet Reno personally? And the answer is, you haven't. We've just turned up at your door because we feel offended. Yeah, and what legal precedent do you have? Because if you feel offended, then there could be thousands of, you know, who are you going to turn up next? Grizzly Adams up in his little shack in Canada? You're offended by the fact that he, you know, didn't paint his barn properly? Or are you wears red plaid instead of blue? Right, so the courts don't have anything to do with this. So I, my, my message to people is to arm themselves with you know, their legalese, to stop all of this. There is no law on the books that can make you wear a mask or be vaccinated or anything like that. Because you have to have an offended party in the freaking court before anything can violate your civil rights. There's another thing we could go on endlessly about, uh, but you know, the, the point is made. But the point I'm really making is people don't. People have uh, run into politics and they're not doing enough on, never do. I don't care if it's 9-11, the SARS uh, you know, thing, uh, Ebola, any violation from a parking ticket up, right? We operate in the dark legally. And that's a tremendous weakness because your Knights Templars, your Knights of Malta, and all of your papacy and Jesuits are all sovereign to that degree. They're all diplomatic bag. They're all, uh, you know, uh, for the most part, unimpeachable. There are obviously exceptions to that, right? But well, even the Knights general, of Malta, just to say, I, there's actually, I've seen the, they have the little tags on all the desks of the UN that sit around the round table. Knights of Malta sits above everybody, and on its tag, it says the Sovereign Order of the Knights of Malta. So just so that you know that, yeah. yeah. And why is it that Sweden has had no lockdown, including Japan and other places? Because they're neutral. Southern Ireland's meant to be neutral. So they break the rules, but Switzerland, Sweden, Belgium, Ireland, right, are all neutral, which means they can give the thumb to any edict of the United Nations, right, or anyone. Uh, that's the, and Sweden has actually used that, right? Right, Ireland hasn't yet, but, you know, Sweden does. How could they even do that? It's legal protection. It's not political protection, folks. It's legal protection. They're legally neutral, right? Vatican City is sovereign. The city of London, where the Templar buildings are, you've been there and done a lot of stuff there. That's a sovereign zone, right? Um, so there are laws right on the books, laws of evidence, laws of disclosure. Where's my witness? Who have I offended? You know, I, I, I look, you know, I'm getting tired telling people this. I'm tired because when I see so much devastation done to people's lives and they don't know anything about it, you know, whether they should have arms, whether they should use those arms on a crowd and all. Look, do you know your legalese or not? It's in the fucking Constitution that you can do so and defend your rights. And don't be afraid of any of those judges. Don't be afraid of the court because that's all about actual laws that are on the books in black and white that cannot be violated. Right? The only way it will go wrong is if you're a nitwit and you're coming in with antagonism or you're coming in with, you know, fuck the system attitude. Well, they'll pick that up right away and you're fucked, you know. And, and of course, other other things need to be done as well. But so it's not as easy as I'm saying, but it, it is easy for a middle class, intelligent person, actually, you know, to, to, to do. This. It certainly is energy efficient. You'll get more out of you know protecting yourself legally than all the histrionics that you're trying to do in the political milieu, which really is you know a, a treading on water. That really does change, and goalposts can move overnight. In the legal profession, it's less likely. And the more professional you are at it, and, and also one thing I should say is when I talk about legalese, I'm talking about within the system of law, not outside it like these other people advocate. You know, a lot of those guys got thrown in point. jail. It's interesting, yeah. And they will, they will. No, I'm talking about what's already in the laws of evidence and what's already in disclosure and witness, you know, the file, the actual clerk's file, your actual case file, uh, which is sacrosanct. Uh, you know, a little bit of education there, a little bit of education on that can be immensely helpful because the only people you can offend are other human beings. You cannot offend institutions and you can't offend the government.
and they, therefore they have no right to come and uh, you know uh, penalize you for and they'll do it you know through the strong arm te technique of the oligarchy right which is just a, a thugocracy you know but but it doesn't hold a cent in court and and that's why you should be very very up on your legality so that when some piss pot at a local store goes where's your mask get out of my store you go you call them over quietly and you say look let me tell you a couple of things right uh i come from a long line of physicians just make up a lie so and we know a lot about immunity and my immune system is very very strong so just take care of yourself you know you're good i support what you feel it will be good for your health but because you're wearing that mask it doesn't mean you've got the right to then interfere with what i do for my health mate just the way you're taking care of your health we're wearing that thing i'm taking my care of my health without so the twain do not meet. You have no right to tell me any more than I've got the right to snatch that mask from your face, throw hot coffee over you, or whatever else, you know? And you, you try to go with that, and you always do it very cordially. And if they keep persisting or they're irate, you just say, let me, all, is this your shop? Is this your store? Are you the owner? You go, yeah, well, look, do you want a civil lawsuit? I mean, the coronavirus is not gonna close you down, but my, my civil lawsuit on you personally for inter interfering with my civil rights, mate, that will shut you down and that will impoverish your family. Do you, I'm giving you the chance. Do you want to continue? Because I'll be calling my you know, legal representative within the hour and you'll be given a summons in a civil court for damages. And by the way, that is exactly what you can do. It doesn't have to be you know, a car bumping into you or whatever. There's damages for wasting your time even, for delaying you and for accosting you in that way. The man, the person has no rights. It's not a criminal action, but you can sue civilly. And you can, even if even if the end comes and you're not actually really paid anything, yeah, but you've fucking given that guy a runaround. And I don't know about America where litigation is often more common and people are not as afraid of it, but in places like Britain and Europe, the very, the very threat that you're going to take into court, that they have to hire their own lawyer to defend against your lawyer, it's path, ask anybody from England and Ireland, you know, that is a, immediately puts them into hyperventilation. They're just, because in America, you know, it's a totally different deal where everybody's going, I'm not going to sue your ass. I'm going to sue you. But in Britain and other places, it hasn't. So it's just you know another little anecdote about the fact that please use your legal power. Don't be picking up cudgels. Don't be getting into fist fights about you know that you support Trump and, and somebody else doesn't, or you're right wing and left wing. Please, 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 let's evolve from that and you start using real power. You start using the law. That is you know I've been saying it from day one. It's what I learned from day one. And you know how I learned it from? Eustace Mullins. There's a source I treat, you know, pick up his book called Rape of Justice, folks. And you come back and tell me that you're talking a lot of rubbish. Read Rape of Justice by Eustace Mullins. And you can, and that's not the only one I read, but by God, that is a towering monument book, just like his other ones are. You know, uh, Murder by Injection. But, but pick up this Rape of Justice, please, and read it and then and mull over what he's saying there. And there's a few, I think there's a few online, you know, things where he talks about Rape of Justice. You might be able to find a video or two about it as well. But definitely read the book because that is a masterpiece of masterpieces.